so for the members colloquium today, uh, we're very happy to have John Herschel and his title is Old and New Results on the Spread of the Spectrum of Brown. All right, perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I, uh, I have to say I've enjoyed my uh, sort of first semester here at IES. I was planning on talking about some of my recent results around determinative processes, but a lot of the people in with the discrete math group didn't see this talk I gave at uh, Princeton, so I thought I would talk about a result that uh, I just released in September. Okay. So also I thought for the sake of you know, talking and collaboration, I should tell you all what I've been doing since I've been here at the Institute. Uh, if you went to my mathematical conversations, you know I've been thinking a lot about Gaussian elimination. This is a talk about spectral graph theory, and also I've been doing some work on determinants. I gave a uh, sort of tutorial seminar on a discrete math, so you can look at. But today, I want to focus on a uh, conjecture from 2001 about the uh, spread of a graph, which I will define. I'll talk about some of the old results around this quantity and more recent results for myself and uh, my collaborators, Michael Tate, Alex, Ria Sanofsky, and Jane Green. And so I'll talk about two conjectures, which we mentioned in some sense. So first, what's the spread of a matrix? So you have some matrix and its spread is the diameter of its spectrum. The study of this quantity dates back all the way to So Mirsky was able to show uh, upper bound, which depends on sum of squared entries minus uh, two over n, the sum of all entries squared. And uh, this upper bound is actually tight for the specific case where you have a matrix which is normal, which has only three eigenvalues. And you have a largest eigenvalue, a smallest, and all others are given by the mean of the other two. Okay. For this setting, we'll look at the spread of a graph. So given some undirected loopless graph, we can associate with it a matrix representation called the uh, adjacency matrix. <clears throat> and here we simply encode this graph by putting a one in entry ij, if there's an edge between vertices i and j and a zero otherwise. So this is a real symmetric matrix. So its eigenvalues are real. And so this question of diameter of spectrum now reduces to the largest eigenvalue minus the smallest. So far, so good. Now, these generic bounds, which I showed to you when considered for the specific case of the adjacency matrix, this upper bound becomes a two times the uh, square root of the size of the graph. And you can see this from Mirsky's original result, but also this upper bound comes from a very sort of basic proof that the uh, sum of squared eigenvalues of an adjacency matrix is at most two times the size of the graph. And you can see this just by sort of taking uh, matrix squared and looking at the trace. And this exact upper bound will come up later. And the lower bound is correct. So this lower bound is for, uh, it has to be, this lower bound for arbitrary matrices has to be for normal matrices. Yeah, no, no. I'm talking about the, the, the lower bound for the adjacency matrix. I mean, I'm thinking about the Ramanujan graph, which is not by far tight. And the two, like what E, e is like, so, so this is like twice the degree more or less, no? What 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 is, what is the yeah? This is more or less twice the degree. For a regular graph, right? Yeah, for a regular graph, this will be twice the degree. This more or less, so the spot can be much less than twice the degree if it's say a Ramanujan graph. Mm -hmm. 
which is not that is the biggest and the smallest. What? I understand what you're saying. Let me think. About Minus two root two three. Is it, are you claiming this is true for every graph, or this is? Yes. Let me think about this for a second. Maybe I'm missing something with the constant here, but no two number. Is, and you're saying you take a a regular Ramanujan graph. Take a, take a regular, say k regular graph. Mm -hmm. Then, then this is going to be in. This is more or less two k. No, I may be missing something trivial here. Yeah. So if you have a k regular graph, the number of uh, edges in your graph is. Uh, K over two times n, right? Right. So, and so you get uh, k times oh, n so times k minus one, one, and this should be good. So it's k. It's not two k. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. Okay. Uh, right. So if you have a k regular graph, so so the left hand side is k or two k in this. The left hand side is k. Oh, because uh, so, so, the so, number so, of edges in a k regular graph. Is, oh yeah, you you count the edges <laughs> twice, and you. Yeah. So this would be I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no worries. Okay, perfect. So in 2001, uh, Gregory Herskowitz and Kirkland looked at the spread specifically of a graph and they proved a number of results. So for instance, they proved a result about a graph with you know, specifically a given order, a given size, and exactly a number of negative eigenvalues they can produce a sort of uh, uh, sort of analog of this previous result from this uh, trace bound that's a little bit tighter by simply using the fact that you have a certain number of negative eigenvalues and using the same trace trick. Uh, using the same type of bound, they can say that if your spread is sufficiently large, well, it has to satisfy some condition saying that you can't have too many edges is the sort of thing that's going on here. And the last thing they show is that for n sufficiently large and greater than or equal to 35, if a graph maximizes spread over all graphs with a certain number of vertices, then this cannot be tripartite. Okay? So they prove sort of a cornucopia of many different types of results in different settings, but they made two sort of like big conjectures that they tried to make some progress on and made some wild statements about which are the following two things. So let's define a couple quantities. I'll just define S of n to be the maximum spread over all n vertex graphs, S of n m to be the maximum spread over all n vertex m edge graphs. And I'll put a little b here to say that we restrict ourselves to b bipartite. And this bipartite setting is uh, interesting because if you think back to this uh, upper bound I gave you here, when uh, this edge set is such that there's a complete bipartite graph, then you're going to get equality here. So that motivates conjecture that if the number of edges is such that you can have a bipartite graph, then the spread is maximized by a bipartite graph. And their second conjecture, which might be a little sort of a strange looking conjecture, their second conjecture is that the graph that maximizes spread over all n vertex graphs is the uh, join of a complete graph and an independent set. So if I uh, drew it as a picture where fill in is one and sort of empty space is zero, it would look like this. Two thirds of the vertices, one third, two thirds, one third. So you have a clique, an independent set, and a join is simply adding all edges between. Okay. So we treat both of these conjectures and we get to say some, uh, some fairly interesting things. So first, looking at this bipartite spread question, it turns out that this, what they thought was true is actually almost true. If 
but not quite. So this is true up to some lower order term, particularly one over the uh, size to the power of three fourths. Which was the size, which letter? Uh, M. M. So size. number of edges is M yeah. and number of vertices is N. And that this uh, is actually tight, that you can actually find examples of uh, M and N, in fact, infinitely many, where a bipartite graph is not optimal, and how far away it is from optimal is actually of the same order up to a constant. And the, uh, the intuition is actually decently straightforward, I think. So Sorry, can you just go back to slides real quick so I can see? Yeah. You're, you're actually disproving their conjecture, right? Yes, I'm disproving. I, okay, let's make sure. Okay. I should say that a little stronger. I'm disproving their conjecture, but uh, saying that their conjecture is asymptotically true. It's nearly true, but uh, I think this is sort of splitting hairs there. Their idea was correct, although the conjecture is false. The first one, the back. The first. The, the B one. Yes. And the idea is, uh, is fairly straightforward. So the idea of why you should think that this is sort of intuitively or somewhat obviously always almost true is you immediately know this is true when you have a complete bipartite graph. Because this <laughs> bound of uh, two times square root of the size of the graph is tight. And so really this is a question of what happens when you don't have, it's actually not really a graph theory question at all. It's a question of finding sort of uh, numbers where you don't have sort of a nice product of two numbers, both of which, the sum of which is sufficiently small. So the point is that the longest length of consecutive sizes for a fixed you know, graph of some order where you don't have a complete bipartite graph behaves like square root n. And so that means we don't have to go very long until we hit a complete bipartite graph. And in fact, when you know you're very close to a complete bipartite graph, you can actually really characterize quite well what the optimal sort of graph is going to look like. And uh, this is some work of Liu and Wang from 2015, that if you have some subgraph of a complete bipartite graph, and you remove, let's say, M, uh, if you take some subgraph of size M, where you've only removed less than, let's say, the number of vertices on either side, then you know the, uh, the optimal way to do this is to remove all edges from one vertex on the larger side. So you can actually characterize exactly what maximizes the spread. And uh, maximizing the largest eigenvalue and the spread is equivalent to a bipartite graph by symmetry. So this upper bound is a, is a very natural idea. The counter example is also intuitive. What you want to do is you want to ask the question, I want to make it very difficult to be bipartite. And the way you can do this is you take a graph, which is a complete bipartite graph, and now you increase the size that you desire by one, okay? And so the question becomes, would you rather add one edge between two vertices in one of the bipartite sets or actually rearrange the bipartition? And it turns out that it is slightly preferable to just add an edge between one of the two apartheid sets. And this can be computed exactly just using calculus and equitable partitions. Okay. So this is sort of the straightforward part. And this, I think, is very intuitive and actually quite straightforward. The, uh, the second conjecture is what takes a good amount of work and actually requires sort of a lot of non-trivial techniques and some interesting ideas that uh, I think are sort of pretty um, thematic and quite useful in sort of extremal spectral graph theory. Yeah, so this is the bipartite part. And now on to uh, 
this general spread conjecture about the graph that maximizes this lambda one minus lambda. And uh, in fact, myself and my collaborators show that for n sufficiently large, this conjectured graph is indeed the maximal situation. And uh, n divisible by three? Uh, no. No, so this is for any n sufficiently large. And uh, we actually get it tight up to these floor and ceiling functions. And in fact, not only do we have this sort of asymptotically large result, but we actually have a uh, bound which holds for all n, which is tight up to order one. So even for smaller n, we know that this conjecture graph is at most order one away from whatever is optimal. And that just follows from <clears throat> taking this upper bound minus the actual spread of this, which you can compute as just a quadratic polynomial. Now, the technique for this result, well, first, let me sort of give a brief sort of hint into where this corollary comes from. And the sketch from the theorem to the corollary is actually a pretty sort of useful and intuitive technique in sort of uh, spectral graph theory, this idea of blow-ups. So you take some graph that, let's say, satisfies this, uh, this upper bound plus sum. And what you do is you replace vertices in this graph by independent sets. So you make copies of this vertex, of each vertex. And then you simply add edges between uh, different parts. So if you have a vertex U and a vertex V, which are connected, you make you know, 10 copies of U, 10 copies of V, and you connect all the copies of U and all the copies of V. By doing this blow up, <laughs> some vertices by independent sets, edges by uh, complete bipartite graphs, you can actually show that the spread sort of increases multiplicatively, which uh, is contrary to our this is how you get this sort of upper bound based off just looking at the limit. Now, the sketch of this, uh, this result is conceptually simple, but there are sort of a lot of details hiding here. It is a 70 page paper associated with this, but from a conceptual point of view, the idea is fairly straightforward. And this is, uh, in my opinion, fairly typical for most sort of extremal spectral graph theory questions. The first thing you want to try to do is find structure. And so we'll look and we'll show that graphs, which are extremal in this sense, have actually quite a special structure. Uh, from there, we'll sort of, uh, sort of punt to the continuous, sure, uh, punt to the continuous setting, where we look at uh, not graphs, but graphons. And we'll look at graphons, which maximize spread. We'll uh, use a uh, averaging type argument, which will reduce us actually to a finite dimensional problem. And uh, while this finite dimensional problem actually turns out to be quite difficult, and even finite dimensions can be hard sometimes. And we will treat this with interval arithmetic. And finally, we'll take a theorem about graph forms, and then bring this back to a graph theorem for n sufficiently large. Yeah. So when you say neural or you mean like using computer assistance? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just sure. What's the dimension that shows up? Uh, so seven. seven. Yeah. Seven. I mean, you take a seven-dimensional eigenvalue problem, and uh, well, it actually can get quite it can get quite complicated, as as we will see. Okay. Sorry, you said this is a a sort of uh, common technique in spectral graph theory? Or so I'll say that, uh, well, this first part, at least for me, and often when I look at sort of results for extremal spectral graph theory, the first step I usually try to take is I say, I'm trying to maximize something or minimize something. Do things which do this all share some common structure? And what is that structure? And so I think that's sort of an important first step. 
And you'll see that uh, this averaging argument, which we use, is actually a, uh, I think, a good tool to have in your toolkit as someone trying to prove extremal results. It's sort of a vertex cloning technique. So one thing that's, uh, I think, always good to look at is ask what happens to your graph when you take a vertex, delete it, and replace it by a copy of another vertex in your graph. And this operation can often sort of uh, tell you something interesting which I, th I think is a somewhat thematic sort of technique. All right, so uh, let's jump in. So first, what structure do these graphs have? Okay. Well, there's a lot up here. If we have some graph which achieves this, uh, this upper bound of, uh, that is sort of maximal for all n vertex graphs, and let's denote eigenpairs by lambda one x and lambda one lambda n z. There's actually a great deal of structure here. First, and this is uh, fairly straightforward. Just by writing out, just by writing out the spread in terms of uh, entries, you can just show that this is equal to the sum of all edges. So I j minus z of i z of j. Just by using the definition of the adjacency matrix. And so you know, it's fairly straightforward that if this is Maximal, if this is actually achieved by the spread of my graph, well, then you definitely should have that adding edges or deleting edges shouldn't increase this quantity. And so you know that, uh, let's say that xi, xj minus zi, zj is uh, positive, well, then. You should have an edge. Because if you don't, well, then you're not sort of maximizing this quantity. If this is negative, then this should tell you you don't have an edge here. And this is all, yes? Real quick, is, is are X and Z normalized somehow? Are they like L2 normalized? Yeah, uh, let's make these uh, unit. I can, okay, maybe they're real valued or something. Uh, so they have to be real yeah. valued because A is symmetric. In real. No. And uh, in fact, you can see it takes a little bit of work and I can sort of sketch a proof that in fact this uh, zero case actually does not occur. So it really is one or the other. And so that tells you you can write your graph as the join of uh, two graphs, one where this uh, eigenvector z is positive, and one where this eigenvector z is negative. And in fact, each of these graphs have a nice structure. They're so-called threshold graphs, which uh, there's a number of equivalent definitions of this, but one is that uh, there's an ordering of your vertices such that uh, if vertex i and vertex j are adjacent to each other and i comes before j, anything j is adjacent to, i is also adjacent to. So you get this really nice structure. So that more or less the neighborhood of j minus i is contained in the neighborhood of i. You also get nice structure that each of these two graphs are really sort of like constant times n vertex graphs, and that both of these eigenvectors are well-behaved. Their infinity norms are exactly what you would expect them to be. And the strongest structure that you actually get is the fact that uh, this quantity, lambda 1 times x of u squared minus lambda n z of u squared, is actually almost constant over all 
vertices up to like order one over n. So I could give a little sketch first, <clears throat> a little bit of a sketch as to why this never actually equals zero. And then I'll give a sort of brief hint into why this sort of structural result holds. So, because I think both of these are fairly sort of typical sort of thematic ideas that you would see in spectral graph theory. So, for this case, where suppose we have some graph where there's some edge ij where this equals zero. So, let's, uh, to make our lives easy, let's suppose this. <laughs> Is I of J is in the edge set of G. Uh, if it's not, the proof is uh, extremely similar. And here we have X of I minus Z of I to zero. Well, all we're going to do is we're just going to remove that edge. And so I'll just call G prime this graph with G with this edge ij removed. Okay. Well, what I can do is I can look at the difference between the Rayleigh quotients of uh, my x and my z applied to this graph g prime. And this is necessarily a lower bound for the spread of this graph. So I have that the spread of g prime is at most I suppose I denote its adjacency matrix by A prime. I'm going to see transpose A prime. See? But because this difference is zero, this is just the spread of my graph. My graph, which by optimality is, of course, at least as part of my new graph, and so all of these are qualities. <clears throat> so we know that uh, X and Z are eigenvectors of our matrix A prime. Okay. Now, what we have here, just looking at X, is we have two eigenvalue eigenvector equations. So we have a of x equals, let's call it lambda x, and then a prime of x equals some lambda prime of x. So, which I'll write a simply by removing these two uh, entries, which are equal to one. So minus the i transpose minus the i. Now, simply by taking the difference, you'll see that uh, EI J transpose plus J EI transpose of X equals uh, lambda minus lambda prime of X. And all I'm going to do is take some vertex that's not I or J. So let me take, uh, K not equal to I or J, and look at what this equation tells me. It tells me, since this left-hand side, the row corresponding to K is just all zero, it tells me that zero equals lambda minus lambda prime of X K. Uh, if these two quantities are equal, and we're going to have a contradiction because I'm adding and removing an edge. How is it that my uh, spectral radius is staying the same? That's a problem. <clears throat> but if xk is zero, well, this is a problem because if I'm maximizing the spread, my graph really does need to be connected, as you see by this sort of like first condition. 
Yeah. So that means by Perun Frobenius, xk can't be zero, and we have a contradiction here. <laughs> so good. So where are you using exactly that? Uh, you're not taking matrices whose support is on where the graph is, and otherwise the real numbers with symmetric and so on. Uh, you can't generalize. We're using that the entries are zero and one exactly. Like here, these you're using the support of the eigenfunction. Mm -hmm. I'm just guess, I'm trying to understand if your theorem might be true more generally. For ah, I see. So this result about not equaling zero. This is not something we pass through that graph on level as sort of a key part of the proof. This is just a nice structure that we have in the graph case. And this is not necessary. But there's no conjectures about, uh, you know, the common de Verdier invariant where you look at multiplicities of eigenvalues you can make by uh, making the entries live on a graph. Non, they're non zero on the graph anywhere, but they have to be zero away from the edges. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like a lot of it is just linear algebra of what you're doing. In yes. some way, you're using that the entries are zero and one hundred. Yes. Uh, and I'm just trying to identify. It, but uh, no, this is actually this is exactly right, and this is something that I would like to touch on at the end. We're using these tools and techniques to solve a specific conjecture, but it is very clear and obvious that our techniques really apply to a broader class. Maybe. And really say a lot more because if you do look at sort of all the techniques, sort of here again, I haven't shown you the proof of all these things. There's nothing really special about the binary nature of zero and one. The one key thing that is hiding here that I feel I should mention is we're looking at the spread, and something that's lurking is the fact that I know I have graphs which achieve spread larger than the order of the graph. And I need this condition to tell me that my lambda n has to be some constant times n at least. I need to know that this isn't vanishing. And this is sort of the key backbone of this. So in a more general setting, as long as you have some guaranteed by some class of graphs which you have, that show that no, this really isn't a one-sided question. I need both of these things to be sufficiently large, then everything goes through. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, this uh, this last condition follows by uh, a decently straightforward technique. What you do is uh, take uh, two vertices u and v, delete u, and make a copy of v and simply compute the Rayleigh quotient, the difference of the Rayleigh quotients of your new eigenvectors and compare them to what you originally had, and this result will, uh, will pop out. And if I have enough time, I'll show you a uh, sort of graph on version of that. Okay, so now let's move on to the graph on setting. So here we have symmetric measurable functions. Uh, w, which go from the unit square to the interval 0, 1. And intuitively, I would like you to think about this uh, function going from the square to 0, 1 as really imagining an adjacency matrix where sort of like you have ones simply in some you know, subregion and zeros everywhere else. And we'll see that, or intuitively, if you think about it for a second, it should be fairly straightforward that if you're maximizing sort of the generalized notion of spread here, that you really want either zero or one. And that in between- so W takes values anywhere between zero and one. Anywhere between zero and one, but uh, really <clears throat> one is between zero and one because, well, if it's something in between, <laughs> going either direction is going to increase spread. And the structural results that I told you for graphs also hold for graph bonds in this generalized setting. And in fact, the key condition is this uh, result at the bottom, which I was telling you about, which is exact in this case. Now, here's the key step. 
if you have a graph on that maximizes spread, it actually has a really nice block structure. So here, just to sort of talk you through what this image looks like, imagine you have seven columns and seven rows. Black in a given box corresponds to entries equal to one, and white corresponds to entries equal to zero. And this is where this sort of seven by seven eigenvalue problem I was alluding to before comes in, because we can prove that an optimal graph on has the seven by seven structure. And the idea is actually an idea of Turpai proving a conjecture of uh, Nikiforov. And so he used a somewhat similar technique to prove a conjecture about the uh, maximum of the sum of a spectral radius of a graph and the spectral radius of its complement. Where, where's seven in your problem? Yes, I will show you. <laughs> so I won't show you seven, but I'll show you why 10, a block 10 by 10 is a natural thing. Okay. But uh, from 10 to seven is some, just some work, some machinery. And you might say, why seven? Well, I was not smart enough to get it down to two. I got it. Yeah. I'm 10 <laughs> to seven <laughs> smart. I'm not, I'm not seven to two. Right. This is what the computer is for. <laughs> so, okay. So the idea here, roughly speaking, is the following. Just like in the previous setting where I did this vertex cloning where I took a vertex, I removed it, and I replaced it with a copy of another, I can do an averaging type argument here. And so the idea here is that I take my W, And if I have the following situation, which I'll draw for you, I'll take some piece of it and call this part one, this part U two, and the whole thing U. So U one, two. So this is. Uh, What I can do is the following. Okay, so let's suppose I choose my U1 and U2 such that I know that W equals zero. everywhere except possibly in this little square here. And I can take some, suppose I can take some value y, I mean some point y and u2, such that this point is in some sense average for my interval, meaning suppose I have, so first, Let's just assume that this y is typical in a sense, meaning that uh, the eigenvalue eigenvector equation holds there. This equation holds almost everywhere. So let's suppose it's typical in that sense, and it's also average in the sense that uh, for some eigenfunction h, h of y squared is equal to the average of h of x. So this is simply the average value on my interval. If I can do this, then I can actually replace this whole interval u2 with copies of y. Meaning that in this whole block here, if I look at how this behaves with respect to any 
any points outside this interval, it's all the same for this entire interval in U2. <laughs> My eigenfunction takes the same value on this entire interval. Sorry, H is an eigenfunction of W. Yes. Yeah, under, under just uh, like in, uh, right on the theory. Just yeah. KX and W. Yes. Measurable and positive. Positive. Yes. Yes. And positive. Now, this is a graphon version of vertex cloning. The way in which I can use this vertex cloning to give my graphon structure is uh, fairly straightforward. So I don't think the camera goes over there, so I'm going to have to reuse the board here, but I hope we get the general idea so far. Are you going to explain why averaging has to do with perfect funny? Is that what you're about to say? Or is, or is that oh, no. So this. Uh, Sorry. So you should think that this is an idea. This is sort of similar to cloning in the sense that I have some set of vertices. I pick one vertex in there and remove all those other vertices. I just clone the one I have. That's actually exactly what this is. <laughs> I see. So now what I can do is let me define my uh, eigenfunctions corresponding to my largest eigenvalue and my smallest eigenvalue. I'll call them, uh, let's say, mu is my largest eigenvalue, <clears throat> eigenfunction f. With eigenfunction g. Okay. And now suppose I want to look at this set S, which is a set of x01, where where g is larger than that. And now what I want to do, so if G is larger than F, then I know in this set, let's say S times S, I should not have any edges. I should, it should be all zeros. And what I can do is I can use some mean value sort of tricks to show that on the interior of any sort of block structure, my function is piecewise, is going to be constant on the interior almost everywhere. And the way that you get this sort of finite structure is by the following little trick. So what I'm going to do is suppose I have three blocks in, let's say, this S. Let's say S intersect uh, a set of X where uh, two of X is greater than zero. Suppose I have three blocks here, meaning I have three places, I'll put them one after another, where on each F is constant. Call this one, two, three. The trick is actually fairly straightforward. If I have this, I know that I can always take some interval containing F2, some of F3, and some of F1 where when I average the uh, sort of integral of <laughs> the eigenvector square, I get exactly F2 squared. And that's the cloning technique, which tells me that I can't have this three structure, which means there's only two blocks in this regime. So then you get two blocks for positive, two blocks for negative, 
And the way that you get block structure on the complement of this S is by simply writing out the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. And you get two choices for the two blocks that I just constructed <laughs> of deciding whether or not you want to include those. And that gives you three blocks on the right side. And that gives you a 10 by 10 structure. <coughs> where S intersect this gives you two blocks. S intersect where G is uh, negative gives you another two. And then the complement of S intersect G positive gives you three. S complement of this intersect where G is negative gives you another three. So that's the sort of broad technique that gives you this structure. To get from 10 to seven is, in my opinion, not worth the conversation. But from here, like I said, you can think about this as a finite dimensional eigenvalue problem. If we think about the class of step graphons where you have seven blocks, <laughs> these seven lengths sum to one, the spread of this graphon is actually exactly the spread of this corresponding matrix, where this diagonal matrix D of A simply has alpha one to alpha seven on the diagonal. So figuring out the graphon that maximizes spread is equivalent to trying to maximize spread over this class of seven by seven matrices. And this we handle by interval arithmetic, but uh, you can also see that you would expect this to be true just by plotting things and looking at your intuition. So here on this graph, I've put large values in yellow, small values in blue. And for each point, I, uh, I give you the value of the maximum spread seven by seven matrix, such that alpha six plus alpha seven is some fixed value, alpha three plus alpha four is some fixed value, and because they sum to one, alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha five is something. And you can sort of see visually that the maximums are achieved here with one third, zero and two thirds, which is corresponding to what you would think the optimal would be. And knowing this, you can sort of already set either alpha six plus alpha seven or alpha three plus alpha four to be zero. Once you do that, you can now assume alpha two, alpha three and alpha four are zero. And looking at alpha five, alpha seven, and then by the sum equaling to one, you have uh, alpha six being the unseen quantity. This is actually maximized on this L here. All of these points correspond to the optimal graph or the graph on version of the optimal graph. If you just think about it for a second. So this is sort of visual intuition that does not take you very long to plot this and you say, oh yes, the seven by seven, yes, this is obviously true, but proving this is a different matter. Uh, the idea for the proof, the real key is that you have this extra condition. And so what you get is you have eigenvalue and eigenvector equations, plus this extra condition for all seven, uh, all seven entries. And this actually, you can sort of do some manipulation. And this can actually reduce you to a four dimensional problem where you have variables mu, nu, and some alpha i and some alpha j, and you have four polynomials. And you're looking to see, are there solutions? And in fact, you can rule out solutions just by interval arithmetic. What you do is you take your region and you just do a simple sort of, uh, divide and conquer type algorithm. You just take your space. You say, can any of these polynomials not be equal to zero on this interval? If you say, yeah, this polynomial can't be equal to zero, you say, okay, good, I'm done on this. If it doesn't, and you say, well, I need to break this up a little bit more. You take whatever box you have and you break it into smaller boxes. And you just keep going and going and going until you have no boxes left. And uh, by doing this for all possible choices of non-zero alpha i's, of which there are actually not two to the seven, but actually uh, 17 cases, once you uh, remove repetition and cases which reduce to each other, you just make uh, 17 
little programs, run this in a pi interval, and away you go. You have a mathematically sort of verified proof. Now, from the Graphon theorem, you simply move back to graphs by taking the limit of sort of spread extremal graphs, and you know that this has to go to the graph on which maximizes spread. And what you get is that uh, this graph has to be this two thirds, one third, up to little o of n vertices. And for n large, you can show this little o of n is actually zero. This analysis is actually just uh, looking at cubic polynomials as a calculus. The question is, okay, so this is the proof. The question is, what else can you say? So a lot of these techniques here, this averaging argument, uh, structural results regarding extremal eigenvalues, eigenvectors, hold more broadly. And you should think this conjecture is actually a specific case of a more interesting question about how extreme eigenvalues behave if you weight them in different ways. And what I mean is, well, suppose you want to just look at an arbitrary linear function of extreme eigenvalues, say beta lambda one minus, you know, one minus beta lambda n. On the two endpoints, it's really straightforward and it's a pretty easy exercise. If beta is zero, you're just trying to maximize the magnitude of your smallest eigenvalue. Well, this is complete bipartite, n by two, n by two. If you're just concerned with maximizing your spectral radius, your largest <laughs> eigenvalue, well, this is just a clique. In some sense, well, our spread conjecture is just beta equals one half. In some sense, you should think that this, uh, this structure here is kind of, you can think of it as part way between a clique and a complete bipartite graph. So the question is, what does the behavior of the optimal graph look like as beta varies continuously from zero to one? So this is a really interesting question. Uh, another question is looking at what maximizes spread for a fixed order and a fixed size where size breaks this sort of like bipartite threshold. The last question is, for what we've done here, do we really need this condition of non-negative entries? Do similar techniques apply to a broader class? And what can you say when you lose symmetry? Does losing symmetry sort of give you more? Or can you show that when you're looking at non-symmetric matrices, that actually maximizing this is achieved by a symmetry? And I can say, when you lose symmetry, of course, sort of all the, almost all the techniques you see here more or less go out the window. All right, I think I will stop here and I will see if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a question. Could you mention some applications of this? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Applications are, are good to think about. Uh, well, in some sense, the best I can do for you is to say that looking at some maximization problem where you're trying to weigh lambda one and lambda n is actually, is a question where, well, what is lambda one really telling you? You're trying to find some graph that is highly connected. But what lambda n is telling you is you want some graph that can be broken into two pieces relatively well. Lambda n is quite large when you can sort of uh, break your graph into two pieces where most edges are going between and not many are within each of the two sets. And so in some sense, if you're looking at some linear combination of these two, you're trying to get the best of both worlds. And that's what sort of shows up with this structure here. But uh, 
then that's the that's the best I can do for answering applications. If you want some in between of these two situations, well, I would say that perhaps something that looks like this could be quite desirable. Thank you. No, I should mention my motivation for solving this is purely sort of uh, math for math sake. So. The kind of historical question. So the concept of graph one is fairly recent. Um, in, in spectral graph theory, would people make a version of this argument without the same words before that kind of graph limit story came into it? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, you can. And the also the other answer is yes, we thought about it. And I can say that what we did. I think you can do without calling to graphons, use regularity, but uh, I think it will get ugly. You're carrying around, you know, epsilons and little o of n's throughout. And in some sense, also, I think the result for graphons and the exactness of it is actually quite beautiful. And so I think the uh, sort of graphon version of this result is actually something nice in itself. And that's what led us to, uh, to take that approach rather than sort of not using graphons. And, and I should mention- If you have a large graph, it's very close to a graphon. What's the relationship between the spectrum and kidney? So, what's that last thing you said? I have a large graph that's very close to some graphon. Yeah. But what is the relationship between the spectra of those two objects? Uh, if, so if you have a large graph, <laughs> And let's suppose it's spread optimal. Or, or just more, more broadly, there's a concept of spectrum of the graphon and of the graph. And of course, the graphon is meant to be. So you can measure closeness through this so called cut metric in uh, sort of uh, graphon theory. And so with any graph, it really is, you know, you can associate with it a graphon just by sort of like cutting it up. And then you can think about distance between graphons. I guess he's asking about the continuity. I mean, so like the dense, the average location of the eigenvalues will, will converge to the kind of spectral density of the graphon. I'm sure that's yes. a soft statement. But I, yes. I guess actually, maybe asking something I'd also be interested in if you have an isolated eigenvalue, okay. and you pick that up like. You know, we're all looking up and the objects converging to a limit, and then uh, there's stable things like the smallest eigenvalue, the biggest eigenvalue, but maybe an isolated yeah, eigenvalue in the middle of the spectrum. Maybe that's kind of tri tricky. I don't know. So the point is that there's only O of one eigenvalues of order n. We're talking about dense graphs. Those will, you will see exactly yeah, but, in the graph, but, but in the middle of the spectrum, you have much smaller eigenvalues where they're kind of irrelevant in the graphing, right? Yeah, so I can say. So in, so in the case that you uh, sparse graph, then it would be much trickier. Yes. Yes. And I should say that a lot of sort of, a lot of what we do here is quite easy because we're looking at these sort of extreme eigenvalues and it's not immediately obvious to me. The question, let's say, once you're looking at you know a sparse situation, you know which which you have, you know, yeah, if you have some nice recent results on, or asking questions about you know, you know small isolated eigenvalues, it's not something I've thought about, and it's not obvious to me actually. It's not obvious to me at all. The graphon problem gives the right answer, right? And the conjecture is true for the graphon, right? Yes, and yeah, and that should be intuitive. So what was their motive? What was their intuition? Were they thinking about that limiting graphon problem, or how did they, yes. where did that conjecture come from? Therefore, yeah, so their conjecture came from, so first I should mention the first conjecture is that the spread is at most n. And I think. That's actually an intuitive thing to think right away. If you know you're just told this problem of maximizing largest eigenvalue minus smallest, you might say, "Well, okay, for the clique, it's n. For the bi clique, it's n. You know, maybe this is 
Maybe this. Thank you for the, the, the very inspiring music. I feel you know, like I'm on a quest. Maybe this is at most end. And someone actually conjectured this, but this is uh, this is incorrect. And the way that they saw this was incorrect. Is uh, well, I'll have to ask uh, Steve uh, himself. I don't know for sure, but I would guess the way they saw that this was incorrect is in their uh, original paper, they did uh, they did exhaustive search up to n equals 12 or something. And they saw, which I failed to mention, they saw that this conjecture holds all the way, I think, up to 12. That's how they made it, by, by actually searching that thing. Perhaps they sort of saw some interesting structure or they, or they searched, I'm, I'm unsure, but I, I can, I should ask. Is there a natural class of functionals of the spectrum such that you know that the extremizers are have those block structures? Hmm. Like I guess if, for example, oh, you take you know you take the measure on the spectrum and you take its variance, or I don't know, like that some powers of the trace stuff like that. I guess there, there's no reason for like the extremizers to have like a finite block structure, right? But how about any any other beta besides the ones you get? Oh, so for any beta, yeah, this is a good question. So that question. I think there the same proof would give that for any beta the exact same. Oh, ah, you yeah, didn't yeah. say so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I should say. Not for any beta, but if you allow me beta bounded away from zero, so bounded away from lambda n disappearing. Yeah, yeah, positive. Uh, yeah, zero and one. As long as it's some constant, okay. some fixed constant. And the reason why I want to be careful is that one thing which is hiding here is that in order to get this graph result, we do need to make use of Davis Kahan. And we do need some. Uh, we do need stability, and we need to make sure that this extreme eigenvalue. So what? And then, then the structure is just the beta, the kind of the analog of that, or what? Let me think for a second. The structure will certainly be at most ten by ten structure. Uh, whether or not we can decrease the structure is. Yeah, yeah I'm just. No, it's a finite it's structure. A, his question, I'm asking a special case of his question, yes. which I didn't realize you were. You will get this 10 by 10 block structure, which I alluded to here, this technique. I think another example is instead of lambda 1 minus lambda n, you take lambda 2 minus lambda n, which is also a natural quantity. Right. It's more related to like the graph being an expander. Right. I think this has a chance to also work. I have not thought about it. like. Peter's question, I know for certain because I've thought about it and I've written it down. Okay. But uh, your question, I think you're right. <clears throat> and I should also mention that you can actually look at an extended class, which myself and my collaborators are. We've proven actually a number of results, not just for which are typing up, which is not just for this exact sort of beta question, which I'm alluding to, but actually a generalization that includes Nikki Foroff's conjecture. So you can allow maybe, you know, some lambda one and lambda n, and maybe some difference of this of a graph, and perhaps of that and its complement, and some allowing both these operations, both extreme eigenvalues of the graph, but also looking at extreme eigenvalues of its complement. Because you should imagine, you know, taking the complement, this is this J, you know, this J matrix, this, you know, once is, is very well behaved. And so these techniques actually apply to that more general structure. And we're actually uh, writing up results on this more general structure and understanding how this applies to actually a wide class of sort of extremal problems like this, which contain a bunch of, you know, these conjectures which have been proven. If, if this broad class of problems is of interest, there's a great uh, review, well, part review, part, you know, new results, a uh, paper by, uh, by Nikki Foroff. It's, I think it's it's called uh, something about extreme eigenvalues of a graph, or you know, maximizing eigenvalues of a graph, or something like this. And he 
talks about you know different problems, different techniques. <laughs> and uh, that would be a good place that I would refer you to. Great. I'd like to thank the speaker again for a very interesting. <laughs>